And also, um, if you want to think in terms of like the saints that came into the valley in 1847, they certainly didn't come to a promised land retirement area. In fact, it was just the opposite. Um, there were things that they had to do that built character, that let them become all that they were to become. In fact, Elder Maxwell always makes the point that these um, trials and tribulations that we are given are very specific for each one of us so that we can tutor, we can learn, we can become all that's intended for us in a, in a divine um, sense. So we also look at Joshua and the children of Israel. They had a literal war on their hands, but nevertheless God told Joshua to um, be not afraid, neither be dismayed, um, but be of a strong courage, and I'll be with you in these, in these ventures. So it seems like in the terms of promised land, there is opposition in all things. So they come into Mesoamerica, and according to um, Michael Crawford, at the beginning of the 15th century, and see now again here we're having to rely on modern data because that's all we have, he says that there were 25 million inhabitants in Central America. Those are a lot of people. So let's just sort of look at what John Sorensen calls um, Lehi's neighbors. I call this shadows of, I was going to call it shadows of the empire, but I thought that had already been used. Um, shadows of existing people. And when we read in the Book of Mormon, it was never intended as a population history. But if you read it as that, there are really interesting clues and nuances. First of all, we find out it's repeated over and over. This is only a hundredth part of the record. So those things that we think are important today, the genetics and so on and so forth, weren't even an issue. And if you've read the Book of Mormon, you can understand why. I mean, Mendel is still in the future, sort of the father of genetics. Watson and Crick, the discoverers of the double helix, um, in 1953, aren't even a thought. In fact, the bacterial theory of disease isn't even a thought. These people have other issues, and um, the issues seem to be social and political. What's really fascinating, I think, is uh, some of um, the language that's used. So this sibling rivalry becomes very dangerous. Lehi is told by revelation to leave. Well, he says, I'm going to take my relatives. And then he says, and those who would go with me. Well, who, who, are, the, who are these people? I mean, there are only so many people that came over on the boat. And he should know everybody. Um, temple construction takes a lot of manpower. So it's going to cause his people to be industrious. So the shadows continued. Um, so what I try to do is look early on in the Book of Mormon for these clues and these nuances. This is what Jacob says. And you can't, it, it just turns out that Lamanites and Nephites isn't even a genetic term, and it's not anyway, because they all share the same genetic background. Jacob says this, he says, but I, Jacob, shall not hereafter distinguish them by these names, but I shall call them Lamanites that seek to destroy the people of Nephi, and those who are friendly to Nephi, I shall call Nephites, or the people of Nephi. Interestingly, polygamy is no longer an accepted practice. So you're not going to have these huge Y chromosome um, incursions. And even if it was, there are not enough women from the ancient Near East to, to drive that genetic agenda. And then this one, I think, is very interesting. It's pointed out by John Sorensen. He talks about Sherem. So Sherem comes to see Jacob, and he says, Brother Jacob, I have sought much opportunity that I might speak unto you, for I have heard and also know that thou goest about much, preaching that which ye call the gospel, and that ye have led away much of this people. Well, come on, when I go to my... I know where my relatives live, don't you? So... Um, it seems like there were these collisions and these interjections with the populations fairly, fairly early. Um, and if we continue, some of these shadows. Um, interestingly, Jerem, who's the son of Enos, who's the son of Jacob, says, oh, wait, this is, and they were exceedingly more numerous than were they of the Nephites. And then there's always this, this missionary effort. 
And it came to pass that many means were devised to reclaim and restore the Lamanites to the knowledge of the truth, the Lamanites or those who do not believe. Alma the Younger and the four sons of Messiah, for example, set off on a long um, missionary effort. And finally, when you go to fourth Nephi, um, neither were there Lamanites nor any manner of ites. So these divisions that we see in the Book of Mormon really have nothing to do with genetics, but they seem to be um, one, one large group. Okay, so let's look at our genes coming from Jerusalem. So you have these four, you have these kin associate groups. You have, let's be generous and say there were four mitochondrial lineages, there were three Y chromosome lineages. So you dump these guys into the gumball machine, we'll make A, B, C, D, and X all the same, and then you dump these guys in. And one of the things that we find right off um, is that if you brought some of these genes from Jerusalem, you're not going to fare very well in this new environment. It's like wanting to be a basketball star, but not being able to dribble or shoot or run. Um, and that is that the way mitochondrial DNA is distributed in populations has to do with what we call selection. So if you can't run, jump, or shoot, jazz are not going to ask you to come and try out. Um, and the same thing, same thing again. Um, natural selection shaped regional mitochondrial DNA variation in humans. And it's very, I think, instructive that in these migrations that we see, we only see a select number of mitochondrial DNA names, A, B, C, D, and X. In ancient history, I think we have to suspect that there were many of these that just went out of existence. And there's this other issue um, that's called coalescence or lineage sorting. So let's um, look at this. So these nodes at the top, these are 18 women. And we're looking at the first generation. It doesn't matter if these are actually women or men. But what happens is you look at the lineage scenario through the generations. And this is 20 generations, or 500 years. This person, this, this woman, had no daughters. And, and we're supposed to assume that all these are unique mitochondrial lineages. And so it, it's even worse if this is strung out across the room where many people have the same lineage and then there's just a couple that have these lineages that are probably at a selective disadvantage. Um, what happens is that through time, things coalesce. There's this lineage sorting process so that when you get down to the bottom, um, there's only two of the 18 that made it, 11%. Um, now, these are just population facts, whether or not you're God's people or, or whether or not you're Nephite, Lamanite, or, or whatever I, you may be. There is a sorting process, and that's based on the idea that these molecules here are the same. Well, you have some, you're outnumbered, you're at a disadvantage because you can't run, jump, and shoot like everybody else. And so there is actually this, this funnel, this sieve sort of process um, that takes place. And if we look at the current people that live in Mesoamerica, you can see this very well. 